surrealism did not arise out of nothing. It developed as a response to other emerging art of the time. The initial group of surrealists drew on Dadaism, which irreverently satirised and poked fun at established art forms. André Breton saw surrealism as a revolutionary movement superseding Dada that would transform outer society. He had a strong political agenda. One of the main influences on the surrealist art style was Giorgio de Chirico, a Greek-born Italian artist who had founded, some ten years before surrealism appeared, a small group of metaphysical artists. In 1911, de Chirico created The Enigma of the Hour, which introduced this new style of metaphysical painting. This presented a stylized architecture of porticos and colonnades, derived perhaps from Italian classical buildings. In 1913, some ten years before the emergence of Surrealism, he painted the soothsayer's recompense. In this he set a reclining figure on a plinth, set in a courtyard bounded by a portico, bathed in strong sunlight with deep shadows, set under a brooding sky. The classical mood of this is contradicted by the appearance of a steam train. Later that year, he created possibly his best-known work, The Uncertainty of the Poet. Here, a classical torso appears in a similar courtyard to the soothsayer's recompense, complete with steam train in the background, and to the front of the torso is a substantial bunch of yellow bananas. In a sense, it can be seen as a still life painting, but de Chirico set up his landscapes with an uncertain perspective. He establishes, through the lines in his paintings, multiple contradictory vanishing points for perspective, which confuses the eye of the viewer and makes him sense being in a strange, anomalous space. De Chirico then teases the viewer by linking together contradictory elements, the classical torso and the steam train, the grey stone sculpture and the living bright yellow bananas. Of course, most people view the painting as referencing Freudian phallic symbolism, but here the torso would appear to be that of Aphrodite. So the phallic bananas appear to sprout forth from a female icon, thus establishing yet another contradictory image. The torso, in fact, is a rendering of an artist's plaster model, which is available in Paris at that time, and indeed appears in other artists' paintings, an example being that of Henry Matisse's plaster cast and bouquet. De Chirico created a number of paintings in this style during the second decade of the 20th century. The dream transformed also with bananas, and the two mannequins and the red tower. Here the lines across the plain of the courtyard create an unsettling lack of certainty to the perspective. He often came to use images of artists' mannequins and tailors' dummies in many paintings. Another example being The Prodigal Son of 1922. De Chirico's imagery and style had a profound effect on the group of artists who would later coalesce under the banner of Surrealism. Thus we see de Chirico depicted in Max Ernst's 1922 painting, A Friend's Reunion, being shown on the top right, just behind Breton. Breton was initially enthralled by de Chirico's work and adopted him into the Surrealists, even buying and trading some of his paintings. Breton was particularly impressed by the painting The Returner, which he helped to sell to a collector. Incidentally, this painting sold recently at Christie's for $14 million. But in 1926, only two years after the issuing of the Surrealist Manifesto, Breton fell out with de Chirico, denouncing him and threw him out 
of the Surrealist group. This was partly due to De Chirico adopting a different, more classical style than his earlier metaphysical period. Despite this break, De Chirico remained a major influence on the Surrealist style, and elements of his pictorial language are much quoted in modern artworks. We will explore this in later lessons in this course. The Belgian artist René Magritte's earliest works were in a variety of styles. Impressionist, Cubist, Futurist, Abstract. In 1927 he held a rather disastrous one-man show in Brussels. Critics there hated his work. He then moved to Paris and fell in with Breton and the Surrealist group. He had already begun in 1926 to create works which prefigured his familiar style, examples being Landscape and Midnight Marriage. With the first appearance of the bowler-hatted artist in his paintings, probably in The Musings of the Solitary Walker, also from that year, these bowler-hatted men made a return to his paintings in the 1950s. He returned to Belgium in 1930, but the three years in Paris were very productive, and in this period he created some of his best-known works. Magritte's work is in no way a spontaneous eruption of unconscious contents in the Bretonian sense, but it's well thought out and structured. Neither does it fit into the surrealist category of being dream-inspired. Instead, Magritte enjoys juxtaposing contradictory elements. Thus, in the two paintings of the lovers, 1928, he depicts them with heads covered with cloths, making the intimacy of a lover's kiss impossible. He places familiar objects in unfamiliar situations. In The Voice of Space, 1931, he paints three enormous cowbells in the sky. His influence on later Surrealists was overwhelming, and we will explore this in a later lesson. Another key early Surrealist was Yves Tanguy. He did not start out intending to be an artist. After completing his national service, he'd returned to Paris, where he came across a painting by de Chirico, which so impressed him that he wished to take up painting. The story is told of how Tanguy, in 1922 or 3, while riding a bus in Paris, glimpsed de Chirico's painting, The Child's Brain, in a gallery window, and then jumping off the moving bus to get a closer look. He soon got to know Breton and the Surrealist Circle, and began painting around 1924. His initial works were rather derivative, but within a couple of years, 1926, he came to develop his now well-known style. The first painting in this style is probably Storm Black Landscape, 1926. Here appears the smooth, rounded, pebble-like forms he later used. In 1927 we have a large painting representing a landscape and composition of 1928. Tanguy created abstract, non-figurative landscapes, often appearing like flat beaches, on which smooth, rounded, almost organic stones are assembled into structures. Tanguy had problems assigning titles to these abstract works, and it's very revealing that he recalled an afternoon spent with André Breton, to quote him, leafing through books on psychiatry in the search for statements of patience, which could be used as titles for paintings. It appears that Breton wished to contextualise Tanguy's work within the surrealist preoccupation with psychiatry. Tanguy, however, reported that he conceived each work before he painted it, his output is a continuation of his initial style, but evolving into more and more complex forms, as we can see in one of his last pieces, Multiplication of the Arcs, 
from 1954. Breton must have had some degree of disappointment with Magritte's games with images and Tangi's abstractions. But in Max Ernst, he found a surrealist he could wholeheartedly delight in. Ernst had been painting since 1909 and had become one of the best known Dadaists before joining the surrealist group. Here is a painting from 1923 at the first clear word. Here is a photo from the same year, 1923, showing Ernst, Breton, Paul Eluard and other artist friends posing in one of those fairground backdrops. In his early surrealist works, such as The Forest from 1927, Ernst began to use frottage and grattage. He would lay paper or prepared canvases on floorboards or other textured items and by rubbing them, frottage, with chalk or smearing oil paint with a knife, transferred the texture to the paper or canvas. He also used grattage, where having covered a canvas completely with the texture, he would scrape away areas and see if any image would emerge. This means of composition, in a random spontaneous fashion, rather than a thought-out painting, must have appealed greatly to Breton. Ernst himself said, This procedure proves to be the true equivalent of what is already known as automatic writing. The author participates as a spectator, indifferent or passionately involved, of the birth of his work and observes the stages of its development. This is exactly what Breton had envisaged for surrealism. The fact that Ernst had also studied Freud must have been a delight to him. Ernst gradually moved away from this random technique and began to use his skills with the brush. Though still occasionally he returned to frottage, as in The Temptation of St Anthony of 1945. His output is vast and complex and we will return to look at his later works in a subsequent lesson. Salvador Dali is undoubtedly the best known of the Surrealist painters. This photo of him is from the early 1930s, before he affected his trademark waxed moustache. He had begun painting around 1910, when only six years old, and as with Magritte, he explored a variety of styles, making many landscapes and portraits. He came to Paris in 1926, but did not participate in the early formative years of the Surrealist movement, only joining in 1929. However, his painting style during his Paris years was beginning to turn to Surrealism. Initially, he was influenced by his friend Picasso, and his work around 1926 was mostly in a Cubist style. This is his composition with three figures from that time. In 1927, he produced an astonishing work, Honey is Sweeter Than Blood, which we can recognise as his first surrealist painting. Suddenly he presents many of the pictorial elements which he was to develop in his mature style. The rounded, almost liquid forms, the open landscape stretching into the distance, the long dark shadows. The horizon of the front plane of the painting, in which most of the action is taking place, is at an angle to the sky, and on this dividing line is set a sleeping head, one side in the lower pane and the other in the sky. Dali was aware of Freudian ideas, so this could well be a reference to the dream world as the unconscious mind. The plane of the dream world has a number of tableaux, some dealing with death. A few months later, Dali created another painting, Apparatus and Hand, reworking some of the pictorial elements he introduced in his first truly surrealist piece. Thus we have the donkey, the decapitated female torso, and at the centre an extended version 
of the cubist depiction of a human form, with the head an inverted tetrahedral pyramid. The action is here set on a square plane, surrounded by a sea, which continues to a far horizon. In 1929, Dali painted his portrait of Paul Eloir. In this we see Eloir, the surrealist poet, pictured as a plaster bust, floating in the sky above a desolate plain. Round his head are various elements that appear in many later Dali works. We note especially the first appearance of a nose-down stylized face, which he often seems to have used as a self-portrait. A crowd of ants, an inverted grasshopper and a lion's head. The mask-like form at the top right is an image of Eloard's wife. Later that same year, Dali was to paint one of his best-known works, The Great Masturbator. This now focuses on the Dali portrait, nose down head, and incorporates the grasshopper, ants and lion's head. Emerging from the back of Dali's head is a portrait of Gala, Paul Eloir's wife. Dali was infatuated with her, and later in 1929 she was to leave Eloir and eventually marry Dali. In the lower foreground, two figures embrace under the overarching form, while on the left, a single figure walks away from the scene, surely a reference to the breakup with Eloir. These two paintings are key works of surrealism, and yet are far from being the results of a random process or dream contents, but are entirely thought out and clearly depict the change in the relationship between Gala, Eloa and Dali. We will return often to Dali during this course. Here we have just looked at the handful of surrealist works he created in the late 1920s. After this, for the next 40 years or so, there was a great outpouring of his creativity and technical flair through a number of different phases. The early history of surrealism is complex, muddled and confused. The many strong personalities were often in conflict. Breton, with his impossible revolutionary and political agenda, regularly ostracised artists from the group when he felt they were not matching up to his expectations. Out of this turmoil was to emerge the powerful and influential art style that still continues today. In the next lesson, we will take a look at the 1930s, which was a high point in the creation of the Surrealist style.